Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, When I was asked to do this, I didn't know how important it would be for me to come up here and uh, speak to you guys. But this is a a great example of God knowing what I need when I don't, you know, so thank you very much. Um, I got sober February 18th, 2012. Um, I have a sponsor, a sponsor, guys. Uh, I have a home group. And I'm currently between uh, service positions, but for anyone interested in service, but if you may have, you know, or feel like you don't have enough time or uh, the right meeting by which to get involved in service, I can tell you what they told me, which is that every meeting you go to, you can be of service. Um, You know, and I I make that a point, you know, I've, I've run meetings and I know how much goes into getting them ready and putting them away. And, uh, any help for those things is always appreciated. Um, I kind of want to say that, um, you know, that first sentence that I said when I walked up here is the most honest I'm going to be all night. Um, (laughs) 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 And it's that, you know, my name is Ian. That's true. It's on my birth certificate. Um, And I'm an alcoholic. You know, that, that simple thing defines me everything from like the cells in my body to the large life decisions that I make you know it's part and parcel of who I am I don't know how to be me and not be alcoholic Um, the benefit that I get today and what I get from this program is that I don't have to be an active alcoholic you know I don't have to get through life while still drinking instead I can find other ways and other tools that help me live this life in full reality in full color and still make it through. So, see, alcohol was in my uh, my life long before I ever took a drink. I come from a family of alcoholics. Um, my mom was a great codependent. Um, she was, you know, often angry. Uh, my dad was uh, an alcoholic and also an opiate addict, so he was often not present. Even if he was physically there, he wasn't really there. You know, I have lots of memories of like shaking dad and like patting him and like you know dad come on pay attention to this i want to show you something he's just like surprised that i'm there you know um uh let's see um i was kind of a sickly kid growing up uh i had a lot of weird things going on physically i had like the acid reflux of an 80 year old when i was still like a teenager um yeah like i went to the doctor and they were like amazed like how do you not have like holes in your esophagus i was like i don't know you know this is just how I live life, you know? Um, I had, like, an extra bone in my foot that meant I couldn't, like, do sports very well because every time I'd run, it would, like, break. And so I'd be, like, limping for a while, and it really sucked, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. So it took, like, two years to figure out what was happening. Um, I had to have surgery, things like that. Um, you know, most kids get mono, uh, you know, and they're out for like a few weeks. I was out for like three months, you know, like, and so I just kind of felt weird, you know, I, I was just kind of like a nerdy kid who didn't really get along well with his parents. Cause my mom was always angry and my dad was like, not really present. Um, and you know, I had friends, but I always had this sneaking suspicion that they were my friends because they felt bad for me. You know, they were they were my friends because, oh, he's that poor weird kid and we need to be nice to somebody. So let's be nice to him. You know, I it kind of gives you an idea of my self-worth. You know, I didn't I didn't see that they could actually like me and spend want to spend time with me, you know, simply because of the person that I was. You know, I could find a way to make it like almost this like self-deprecating situation where like, no, I'm not really good enough to be hanging out with these guys, you know, but. I'm glad they, they're, you know, stooping down to my level, at least for a little while. Um, so by the time I had my first drink, or really my first drunk, um, I needed it, you know. Um, it was something that, you know, life was really hard up until that point. Um, my first drink was, I think, yeah, I think it was 11. It was a glass of champagne. The only thing I really learned is that champagne tastes worse than Skittles, you know. Um <laughs> 
uh, you know, I had Skittles and champagne, you know, and I was trying the champagne. I was like, this is gross. I'll just stick with the Skittles. Um, but my first drunk, um, you know, my dad worked for Microsoft. And so, um, you know, back when before Microsoft was like a big thing and, um, and he, you know, kept working there and then ended up making a lot of money. And so, um, we were on a ski trip to France and, um, the waiter came up, I was a teenager and he offered me a glass of wine. And I looked at my dad like, Oh, I, you know, I can't have wine. Right. And he's like, you can have some wine. You know, we were having a fancy dinner and he said something along the lines of like, it's only a half glass. It won't get you drunk. I'm being completely honest. I thought that had something to do with the fact that they would only pour a half glass. The waiter kept coming by and kept pouring me a half glass, but I thought that because it was a half glass, I wouldn't end up getting drunk and it would be fine. <laughs> I don't know how much wine I had that night, but it was enough to finally feel like I could take a uh, uh, breath of fresh air. You know, it finally felt like my skin fit right on my body. You know, it finally felt like I could just be okay with being me. And if you had a problem with that, then that was your problem, not mine. You know, and that was revolutionary for a kid like me. You know, I, I'd never felt that way. And um, it was so freeing. You know, like I found freedom through like four or five half glasses of wine. And that was that was revolutionary. Um, you know, a lot of people have stories about how they then, you know, puked and passed out and it was like that for them for the rest of their time you know that's that's not my story um you know I enjoyed it and I knew that was something that worked for me um but I didn't then go out and get super plastered every single chance you know um but you know what I jumped at the chance anytime someone offered alcohol you know that I knew that that was something that worked for me and that was something that I then when it was presented to me definitely took advantage of um you know I didn't come home and then say like, guys, we got to go get this thing called alcohol. Let's drink a lot of half glasses of wine. No, I just, you know, kind of talked to my friends and said like, hey, this is a fun thing. You know, maybe we should try it sometime. And they were like, well, I don't know. You know, I kind of hung out with the nerds. So we were sort of like, let's just play Risk, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and we did. But then, um, you know, eventually, you know, uh, we started drinking and um it was something that I just started doing. Um, and, you know, later on, I started doing it more and more. And, um, you know, despite kind of being a nerdy kid and being relatively smart, I got awful grades. Um, I did not do well in high school. I almost flunked out a number of times. But, um, I, you know, it was much to the chagrin of my teachers, I think, because every time I took a test, I like scored, you know, 100% on these things, but I would not do homework, you know, no matter what it was, no matter what they gave me, whatever project, I just didn't do it. Um, yeah, uh, it, <laughs> there's a there's a line in the book uh, that speaks to that. I think it's something, you know, um, oh, I'm forgetting it now. But anyway, um, something about rebelliousness is in our nature. And uh, that was definitely me. Um, so by the time high school was getting out, I was drinking fairly regularly. Um, I did not have a lot of prospects. Um, I knew I kind of wanted to go to college, but I didn't know how I would go about doing that. Um, and lo and behold, a guy calls me and asks if I ever thought about joining the army. And I said, well, yeah, but I'm kind of this sickly kid, so I probably couldn't get in. He's like, well, why don't you come down to the recruiting center and we can talk about it? And I was like, okay, you know, fine. Um, and I was so amazed that these people might actually like want me to join their club. Right. Um, <laughs> I know. Um, and so I go down and we talk and, you know, he lays out all these jobs and, you know, I was a little like, you know, I don't, I don't know if I really want to be like the guy on the front lines. He's like, Oh, don't worry. We got lots of jobs. The army's a big thing. There's all sorts of stuff you can do. And so I kind of settled on this like reservist paralegal thing. Um, you know, one week a month, two weeks a year, that sort of thing. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I could do that. And I tell my parents about this and they're, um, by this point, my dad had gotten sober. Um, but he'd only been sober for like a year or two. So they were just kind of in this, like, 
just don't make things worse sort of phase. So they were just kind of like, oh, well, you know, if that's what you want, we'll support you. And I later found out years, years later that my mom had said to herself when she started having boys that, um, you know, she'd think she was a success as a parent if none of her sons ended up in the military. Um, so, <laughs> hey, you know, um, anyway, uh, uh, so I started doing this whole thing about joining the army and, um, you know, like a good alcoholic after a while, I thought, you know, why go halfway? Why not go all the way? So I ended up fully, once the paperwork was all signed for infantry, um, you know, with the full intent of like then going on and doing like airborne and like special forces and all this other cool stuff, you know, cause why half ass it? Right. Um, you know, I, that all or nothing thinking is absolutely a characteristic of my disease. You know, it's you know, I either do nothing or I do all of it. You know, there's no in between. Um, and so and that was my thought, you know, and God bless my recruiter. You know, the guy he'd been like, uh, you know, he'd had desk jobs his whole life. And I came out of that, you know, room where I signed my paperwork and he was like, yeah, and you signed up for the infantry. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, you know, we're at war. Right. And I'm like. Uh, yeah and he's like oh goodness you know he was like he was like appalled by this thing you know um i would like actually do that um i know and so um you know and my parents were equally appalled and kind of like did the recruiter make you do this i was like no he didn't you know he was just as surprised as you guys and like, okay. <laughs> you know and they're like oh, we want to support you and i'm like thanks um so i i i think it was uh two months past the age of 18 and two weeks out of high school and I shipped out for basic training. Um, and I was in Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, I learned all the stuff about how to be an infantryman there. Um, you know, and I finally got to spend time around real men, you know, and, uh, yeah, it was, um, very exciting. I learned a whole bunch of stuff about me and about the world and about, um, you know, Georgia, which, you know, if you're from Georgia, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's a lovely place, but don't go to basic training there. Um, uh, my first duty station was in Germany, um, which, how convenient, right? The drinking age there is 16. So, um, you know, I finally got to go out to bars and clubs, and that was when I first started blacking out. Um, and it was just sort of weird, you know, like I'd wake up in my bedroom and like I'd have peed myself and was just kind of confused about how did that happen? I don't remember any of this. Huh, weird. Um, but it wasn't really like a big deal. Everyone around me was doing that as well. Um, so it just was sort of part and parcel of being in Germany, you know, I thought. Um, and this is how people drink. Um, let's see, after being there for about nine months, we shipped out to Iraq. Um, this, so I joined in 2005, um, and it was right around 2006 that we ended up in Iraq and we ended up in a place called Ramadi, um, which at the time, so you spend a little bit of time in Kuwait before you go up, up North. And, um, you know, that's in part to get acclimated to the fact that it's a desert and it gets up to like 115 degrees on the regular there. Um, and you know, I remember the thing people would talk about because there's usually a lot of units moving through there you know the thing people would talk about is when are you go north where are you going and um at that time you know when you said when i when people asked me that and i said oh i'm going to ramadi their response was "Ooh, good luck you know it's like yeah thanks and that's that's kind of how it was um you know and war you know unequivocal unequivocally sucks um you know uh i think we went there with 40 people and we came back with like 25 you know not everybody died but lots of people got hurt and some people did die um we were originally only sp supposed to spend nine months there we ended up spending 15 months there and um i really did not like it you know um i had to do things i really didn't want to do um not because someone told me to, but because that was the situation. You know, you, there's not a lot of options when someone's shooting at you about what you're going to do, you know. And when you're the machine gunner, it's kind of important that you actually, like, return fire, you know. Um, so that happened, you know. Uh, it was war. There were lots of explosions. There were lots of firefights. Um, you know, uh, it was 15 months of hell, 
you know, quite frankly. Um, so I came back to Germany and I needed a drink, you know, again, you know, I, I knew that that worked. I remembered that feeling that I got and that's what I sought out. You know, my parents, um, at this point, they, you know, they knew what was going on. They didn't get all the details, but they, they knew. And, um, they'd offered to fly all the way out to Germany to see me come home. And I told them, no, don't come. I think I'd rather just get drunk. You know, and that's what I did. Um, and that's what I did for the next like two or three months, um, which, you know, in the in the military, it's kind of expected that like, yeah, once you come back from war, you know, you go back to garrison. Um, yeah, people are going to show up drunk and that's fine, you know, at least for a little bit, whatever. But then you start like actually doing your normal army stuff of like, you know, going on runs and doing push ups and, you know, filling out paperwork and training and all of the things that go into that. Um, I didn't do that, though. I just kept drinking um, and it became a problem. But thankfully, the army was moving me to upstate New York, um, a place called Fort Drum, which, you know, if you're in the army and someone asks you, oh, where are you moving to? And you say Fort Drum, they go, ooh, <laughs> good luck, you know, because the, the joke, at least, um, is that, you know, units in Alaska go to Fort Drum to do winter training um, because it gets so damn cold there. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I don't think they knew what to do with me in Germany. They were just like, ah, oh, whatever. He's just getting drunk. Send him on to the next place. They'll deal with whatever's going on. And um, I kind of got from those few months while I was there that, like, you know, this probably isn't conducive to, like, not getting in trouble. And uh, getting in trouble in the Army sucks, you know. Um, so, I, you know, I showed up at Fort Drum, and I kind of, you know, managed to, like, clean things up a little bit, you know, once I got there. And, um, you know, they started giving me responsibilities and then they started giving me rank. And before I know it, I'm like a team leader and a squad leader. And I'm trying, you know, after this, it's been like a year or so. And, you know, I'm still kind of trying to drink like I really need to drink. And it's kind of becoming a problem. Um, you know, like I'm drinking with my soldiers, I'm blacking out, um, they're getting DUIs and I'm not really seeing it as an issue other than the fact that they got caught, you know, because I was drinking and driving and not getting caught, you know, so obviously that's their problem, not the fact that they're drinking and driving. Um, you know, I was blacking out fairly regularly and, um, you know, it was, it was starting to become a problem again, but um, we were going to Iraq. And this time, my great excuse for why I was drinking the way I was is I was going to be stop lost, which if you don't know what that is, the army basically in the fine print says that, you know, we own you for the next eight years at the signing of this contract. Should we decide it, we can keep you for that entire time. And that had come up. That had been invoked for me. Um, I was only supposed to do four years of active duty, but they said, you know what, why don't you come to Iraq a second time? Uh, which I was not excited about. I'd had that first tour that was 15 months, and I did not want to do that again. Um, and so, you know, that was a great excuse to keep drinking, and I drank like I could. Um, we ended up going to Iraq again. Um, it was a very, it wasn't very different, but, you know, in context, I guess, you know, we got, you know, mortared once, we had a rocket shot at us, we got shot at once, you know, all of that would have happened in one day of my first tour. And that took, you know, nine months in my second tour of Iraq. Um, so it, it was a little bit different, um, but it still wasn't great. You know, it was nine months in the desert in this country that I didn't want to be in and um, doing this thing that I didn't want to do. Um, so I ended up coming back um, after nine months there. Um, and I knew I was going to go to college, but um, I was going to travel first. So I decided I was going to travel around the world and um, I did it, you know, I, you know, started in Amsterdam like you do. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, went to Paris, uh, went to Germany, met up with some old friends, traveled around Greece, went to, uh, I spent some time in Qatar. I went, to, I spent like a month in Australia, some time in Japan, 
um, and then about like a week in Hawaii. Um, and it was great, you know, but that, that was sort of the first sign that I had that like something was wrong with me that didn't really have to do with the army. Right. Like I'd kind of been able to lie to myself and say that, you know, like, well, it's cause the army makes me do all these things that I'm like, not okay. And the reason that I drink, like I do, but here I am, you know, on like this beautiful Greek Island with these awesome people. And I'm standing there smoking a cigarette, drinking a beer, looking at this big cliff, thinking like, you know, I could just jump off. I didn't see anything wrong with that, you know, like that, that might be a good idea. Mom would probably not be okay with it, but, you know, I'd be okay with it, I guess. And then I, you know, I would have to like stop myself and think like, man, that's weird. Like I should be enjoying myself. I'm on vacation. I'm traveling. I'm in you know, Mykonos, Greece, why am I having this issue? This is, this is weird, you know, and, and that just kept coming up throughout my travels. You know, I'd be in Hawaii, which is, you know, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. And, um, like I would not be okay. You know, things were not all right for me. Um, and alcohol was a great solution for that, you know? Um, and it was always there, you know, no matter where I went, alcohol did the same thing for me. And I was very grateful for that. Um, so I came back to the States, I came back to Seattle at the bequest of my mom, you know, it would, the conversation went something along the lines of, so, you know, Thanksgiving is in a couple weeks, right? And I was like, yeah, I know mom. She's like, yeah, it'd be really nice if you were there. I was like, okay, well, you know, I was planning on going to like, you know, Korea and like maybe spending more time in Japan and like doing all this stuff. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be great if you were there. I was like, oh, okay, mom, you know, all right. So I showed back up and um, I was living at home and I started at a community college. And, um, you know, this is this is kind of when drinking really uh, sunk to new depths for me. Um, it always it, it had stopped being this party, you know, after Germany, basically. Um, but this is when it really started being me drinking alone at home uh, with nothing else. Um, I started smoking a lot of pot and it would just be, you know, I identify as an alcoholic, even though drugs are in my story later on, there's opiates, but, um, because, uh, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I do drugs alcoholically, you know, again, it's not like, Oh, a little bit. And then it's okay. I mean, I do the whole thing, you know, no matter what it is, I do all of it if I can. Um, and that's often how I drank, you know, I, I started to get into this habit of, you know, I would spend the weekend drunk, you know, I'd, I get, you know, 20, 30 drinks in me within a span of like 12 to 16 hours. And then I'd spend the rest of the weekend recovering and then try and do my best to get like straight A's in uh, community college. And um, that was a lot of effort. It took a lot of work to do those things. Um, and, you know, things started to slowly fall apart. Um, eventually, my last quarter there, um, you know, I couldn't keep up the straight A's. I was starting to fail out, um, you know, which is like this crazy drop, right? I was getting straight A's. And all of a sudden, this one quarter, I'm like doing really poorly. And that um, partly had to do with the fact that I fell off a stage and broke my ankle and was taking a bunch of opiates and drinking and smoking pot and ended up in the hospital because I thought I would die. And like all of these other crazy things that were going on, I just could not manage it all. Um, and at some point I decided, you know, I think drinking isn't good for me. But I remembered from a conversation that I had with my dad that, you know, it's a sign of an alcoholic who, you know, says, you know, I'm not going to drink for this amount of time. And then they go back to drinking, you know, like that's alcoholic thinking. And so, you know, my solution to that was to never try and stop drinking. Um, but this was finally it, right? Yeah, yeah, I'd never tried. Um, but this was finally it, you know, this is okay. You know, I, I don't think I should be drinking anymore. I'm not going to drink anymore. And it was like the most insane 10 days of my life. You know, I remember going out with some friends and thinking like, oh, shit, you know, like they're going to want to drink. And I can't say no, but I had this thing. But then if I drink, I'm an alcoholic. You know, it was this like huge catch 22 and they ended up not wanting to drink, but I like really wanted to drink. And it was this huge issue um, for me. You know, they had no idea. They were just like, oh, I'm tired. I'm going to go home. I'm like, 
<laughs> so, um, you know, I went home and I smoked all the weed I could. Um, and this thing that normally would be a very calming experience was instead this incredibly stressful period where, you know, I think for like hours I was trying to write in this notebook and I couldn't even do it. You know, I couldn't put thoughts from my head onto this paper and it got so crazy. And I was just in this state of mind that was just absolutely baffled by what was going on. And, um, you know, I remember sitting there thinking like, God, this is such a struggle. Why is this such a struggle? You know, it feels like my whole life has been a struggle. And then this voice came and it said, you know, your struggle is with addiction and the answer is God. And I was like, Oh shit. You know, what the hell was that? I don't, I'm not okay with that. Um, but I, I could like write that down in the notebook. And I thought, I still was looking at this thing. I was like, well, what do I do with that? And then the voice came back and said, why don't you go tell your parents? I was like, Oh no, like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, but it was like midnight and you know, I was like, okay, I guess I gotta go do that. And so I kind of built up in my head that I would like go in and be like, mom, dad, I think I'm an addict. And they would like, Oh, welcome home, son. And give me a big hug, you know, and all this stuff. And what ended up happening is I kind of like woke them up and I was like, uh, I think I'm an addict. I need to like go to AA or something. And they were like, Oh, was this an emergency? <laughs> I was like, well, well, n no, I, I mean, like, I'm, it's okay. And they were like, okay, good night. You know, like they were busy sleeping. Excuse me. You're interrupting this. And um, I was like, Oh, okay. And so I went back, um, I tried to sleep, didn't, um, you know, I was really hoping that the next morning they would be like, that was crazy, huh? But instead they were like, Hey, so about last night, I was like, Oh shit, you know? <laughs> and so that started this whole process of getting sober. You know, I ended up going to, um, a counselor named Ross and, um, you know, this was three days stark raving sober and I don't, I don't know what I said, but it was a whole bunch of gibberish and it made no sense to me. And I'm sure it made no sense to him, but two things that stuck out to me was, you know, he stopped me at one point and he said, you know, Ian, it sounds like you've reached an emotional bottom. I was like, yeah, yeah, I can really identify with that. And then the other thing is that he said, you know, maybe you should go to AA. And I was like, well, you know, isn't there something else I could do? You know, is there somewhere else I could go? And he was like, well, there's NA. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, well, it's, you know, it's for uh, narcotics addicts or, you know, kind of more general addicts. And you've got some of that in your story. So maybe that would be a good place for you. And I was like, no, thanks. I'll go to AA. Um, <laughs> And so I ended up going to my first AA meeting that night with my dad. And, um, you know, from that time, you know, I was pretty much sold on this thing. You know, you guys finally spoke a language that actually, you know, spoke to the heart. You know, like uh, it, you were telling my secrets in front of me as if it was like old hat. You know, like, yeah, this is this is exactly what we do. We're alcoholics. We drink till we black out and do crazy shit, whatever. You know, and I was like, <laughs> you know, stop, Shh. don't say those things, <laughs> um, you know, and, um, some of the other things they told me, you know, uh, cause I ended up sharing and it, again, it was a bunch of gibberish. I have no idea what I said, but you know, one of the guys came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, I know exactly how you feel and you never have to feel this way again. <laughs> you know, and that was really enticing to me. I wanted that, you know, um, the other thing that I thought was kind of weird is they said, you know, you newcomer, are the most important person in the room, except me. And I was a little weirded out by that, but I get it now. You know, I get it today. After, after doing this thing for five years, I get it. You know, um, the newcomer absolutely is the most important person in the room, except for me. You know, if I'm not here, what sort of sobriety am I doing? You know, if I don't make it to meetings, if I don't make it to my meetings with my sponsor, if I don't sponsor people, if I don't try and be of service, you know, what is my sobriety? You know, what I can tell you about today in my life is that things are really good. Um, I've got an awesome job. Um, I recently applied to graduate school, and it looks like I'm going to go to upstate New York um, <laughs> <laughs> to study neuroscience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and what that means is a bunch of upheaval in my life. 
you know, I've, I've built a home, I built a community here and, um, I love it here, but you know, I also really like what I do and it's something that I've dreamt about doing for years now. And, um, I'm really excited about it. And I know that with this program of, and with the help of a power greater than myself, I can do those things and walk through life with some peace and serenity, you know, and that, that doesn't mean that I very carefully manage my life so that everything goes out the way I want it to. What it means is that in spite of life happening, I don't have to react to it the way I used to, you know, instead I can respond to it. You know, and I, I can, I can go through what's happening even when I don't like it. And I can still be a relatively sane, relatively happy human being. So thank you for that. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 